UCLA School of Dentistry. But as a lot of you know, we did have a very in-depth lecture series before this over the summer, just on the admissions process. So this is just gonna be kind of a brief overview with a special focus on how the admissions process has changed due to COVID. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speakers today, Dr. Barry Margolis and Dr. Edmund Hewlett. And they both play a really big part in our admissions process here at UCLA School of Dentistry. So here we go. All right, would you like me to begin? Go for it. All right. So as Elizabeth said, I'm Barry Margolis. I'm the Associate Dean of Student Services here at the UCLA School of Dentistry. I'm getting a kick out of this photo because I think on the day this photo was taken was the one time in maybe the last 30 years that I shaved uh, <laughs> my small amount of facial hair off. So, God, I look like a baby. Anyway, so my role here at the dental school is, well, these days I do a lot of different things and some of it is related to, to COVID where we, we don't know from one day to the next what's going what's gonna to be new around the corner. Um, but my role primarily or partly is involved in sort of overseeing the admissions process and, and making sure that, you know, we're doing things the, the right way. Uh, Dr. Hewlett is, is the vice chair of the actual admissions committee. Um, in addition to that, um, well, I, we have 392 students here in the pre-doctoral pre, uh, program uh, at our school. And I am charged with making sure that everyone is doing the right thing to the best of my ability. Um, if students are struggling and they, they need to come talk to somebody, they will come to our office, the Office of Student Services. And so uh, that's, that's, those are the primary things that I, that I do at the school. And um, why dentistry? Well, so I'll talk uh, uh, for a minute about why dentistry for me and then why I think it, it's, it's a great occupation currently. Um, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I have uh, a cousin who was about nine or 10 years older than me, who was a general dentist. And I shadowed in his office and I watched him take a, a front tooth that was broken down to the gum line and rebuild it back into a tooth with a temporary crown in about a uh, half an hour. And I was just so taken by what he did for that patient. And uh, I think that's a main factor for dentists. It's such an awesome occupation in the sense that you can really change people's lives. The way people view themselves, the way they carry themselves, the way they all of a sudden are smiling when they weren't smiling before. There's great personal satisfaction that you will get and that I got over the years uh, in being able to you know whether it was bread and butter fillings or whether it was elective uh, aesthetic procedures, um, there most most days going to the office when when I would be driving home at night, I'd say that was a good day because I had an impact on on somebody's lives. So um, in terms of um, the occupation currently, uh, U.S. News has <clears throat> ranked at the number two uh, job uh, over 2019 and 2020, and um, they've ranked at the number 10 best paying job, which is also a nice thing. You know, I have to say that dentistry has given me, uh, it's afforded me a lot um, in terms of being able to do the things for my family that uh, you know I wanted to be able to do without worrying about it from day to day. So I will shut up now and I'll turn it over to Dr. Hewlett for his introduction. Thank you, Dr. Margolis. I am Dr. Ed Hewlett. I serve as our Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at UCLA. And as Dr. Markola said, I also serve as the Vice Chair of our Admissions Committee. 
Um, I'm a professor in restorative dentistry here and I'm a prosthodontist by training. I, uh, so my, my uh, area of responsibility, I guess, as associate dean um, is uh, just as it says, you know, I, I guess you could call me the chief diversity officer uh, for the school. Um, I don't like to look at it as, a, as an officer, but as a uh, facilitator, as, um, you know, to, to encourage uh, embrace of the principles of inclusivity, uh, to, to celebrate diversity, to seek to create equity, uh, to create a place where everyone feels that they belong. Um, so it's a lot about a lot of my work is about the culture. Um, I spend a lot of my time um, really focusing on students and student welfare, and I do that um, arm in arm with Dr. Margolis and the the staff in the student services office at UCLA. Um, I've been uh, I've been full time faculty at UCLA since 1987, and um, at this point in my career, you know, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to focus on. Um, I want our students to have positive experience. Uh, dental school is hard. And I don't think, like, we, we don't need to make it any harder than it already is. I think that's that really has to be our mantra. Um, and I want everybody to feel welcome at our school. That was my experience. I went to UCLA. I graduated dental school in 1980. Whoa, yes, that's been a minute, but um, uh, uh, it's been a wonderful career. I did practice for a short time. Oh, why dentistry? You know, it's um, Dr. Margolis had kind of an aha moment he described. Mine literally is no joke. Mine was a huh moment. It really was. Um, you know, I'm halfway through college or more, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I loved science. I was a biology major. Um, and someone just put the idea in my head, have you thought about dentistry? And I went, huh. And I started to look into it and it just felt right. I heard the calling. I always love working with my hands and making things, fixing things. I knew I wanted to do something working with people. And it's been a, just a, a gift of a career for me too. Just like Dr. Margolis said, um, the effect that you can have on people uh, it, 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 and just, you know, you never stop learning. You never stop, you know, your intellect never stops getting challenged. <clears throat> it's just a great, it's been a great ride. Um, so yeah, I did practice uh, as an associate for a few years and then had an opportunity to take a full-time position. I was attracted to getting to work with the greatest students in the world and the intellectual stimulation. But since that time, I've also continued to practice on a part-time basis in our faculty group practice as well. So I didn't want to give that up. So that's that's the short version. And um, let's move on. Let's get to some info and then get to your questions. All right. So um, I, I am going to just briefly contrast my, my uh, path with Dr. Hewlett's. I am an East Coast guy from Boston, uh, lived there for almost my entire life came here and I went to Tufts Dental School. So a little, little different. I came to UCLA in 2014 and um, been loving it ever since. Um, and I was, I was very fortunate because when I, I did two years in the public uh, National Health Service Corps and then I became an associate in an office and Elizabeth will remember this story, but I, I love telling this story because my partner was Chris Evans's father. So Captain America, you know that guy, the actor? So his dad, so I knew Chris when he was like three years old. I have cute pictures of him when he was a baby. Um, and his dad was just a very kind, hearted man who really mentored me along the way and and you know it's it's great to have those mentors and you should try to cultivate those along the way as you go in any case so this is the class of 2023 um i looked at the statistics for the recently uh the recent arrival of the class of 2024 they're very similar they're actually i think exactly the same in the demographic in terms of uh, 52 females to 36 males which is a complete flip from when dr hewlett and i 
I were uh, in dental school, I'm, I'm sure. Um, I'm just a couple of years younger than Dr. Hewlett, but uh, we're, we're talking the same, the same uh, ballpark. Uh, from nine states, and you can see what the statistics look like there. Um, you know, a point we like to make is that these statistics are averages, you know, and we don't have an, a, a real preconceived notion of you have to be a 3.8 or above, you have to be, you know, whatever. Uh, Dr. Hewlett will be talking more about, you know, where statistics sort of <clears throat> fall in in terms of looking at you holistically. So next slide. So Dr. Hewlett, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Right, okay. So um, just a quick overview about how our committee works. Um, we wanna get started earlier. Everybody wants to get started earlier. And so it behooves you to get your applications in earlier. Uh, there was a time and just not too few years ago um, when UCLA would tended to start a lot later than other schools because we would wait till our fall quarter started and then um, start working. Be reviewing applications in February, even March and, you know, still interviewing in early the next year. Um, and that just wasn't working. And so we made a concerted effort to change that up. Um, it was one of those things, well, well, that's always been that way. Well, no, that wasn't good enough anymore. So uh, we changed that and it's been working very well for us. Um, and uh, we're very happy about that, but it does mean, you know, getting your application in as early as possible really is a thing. It is important. Um, on our committee, it's a mixture of faculty, um, and uh, we, al we always have two students. Our committee, um, one from the third year and one from the fourth year. And actually the third year person uh, automatically is then becomes the fourth year rep as well. So it's a two year term and the input and they, they review every application and they vote on every application um, and their input is invaluable. You know, the insights that they have that they can share with us um, is invaluable. We have uh, dental faculty and we also have two, um, two uh, basic science faculty from the School of Medicine who sit on our uh, committee as well. So it's a very, you know, the, the whole point of a committee is to get um, frames of mind and looking at applications a different way and then we talk it around and, and do what we do. Uh, once we're up and running in the cycle like we are now, um, we get a new batch of applications every week, about a week ahead of time. And then so we spend a great deal of time reviewing those applications and reading everything that's in them. Um, and then we meet uh, one evening a week to go over that batch and discuss it. And there tends to be quite a bit of discussion for, for some of the applications, you know, because people have questions or maybe they'll have a concern and they want to talk it out and then maybe someone else which is usually the case is more or less advocating well you know that's that's really not a concern not you know respectfully but you know what about this did you know here's maybe what here's why that happened you get the idea so um it's a very dynamic committee i'm very proud of our committee i've been in there a long time and um, i'm very proud of the amount of effort that they put in to really do a holistic review and consider all of the, what we call the non-cognitive variables. You know, like what's your story, right? What's your road travel to get to this point? What were your accomplishments? What, what benefits did you have? What, what barriers did you have? And how did you deal with it, you know? Um, so that's, uh, we can get more into that if you have questions, but let's go into the next slide, please. Ah, DAT and GPA. Um, so I know there's questions <clears throat> about our decision this year to make the DAT optional. Um, that was related to COVID. Uh, I'll just explain that as briefly as possible. The, this was, every dental school had to decide what to do when everything shut down, the testing centers shut down. Uh, and we discussed it and we came to the conclusion that 
you know, if a student, if an applicant was unable to take the DAT through no fault of their own, and then was going to be delayed until September, or October before they could take it, we didn't want to penalize um, students that were in that situation. So we made a proposal to our faculty that um, if an application does not have a DAT, we will still consider it complete so that we can start reviewing those in August as well, rather than making them wait until literally, I know there's some of our applications that we're looking at now, they're just now taking their DAT because it got rescheduled. That was the reason for that. So what does optional mean? Optional means that you know if you have a DAT, of course we're gonna look at it. If it's a strong DAT, of course it's gonna matter. It's not for nothing that you, that you scored a, a strong DAT, it does matter. What we're trying to do also is, you know, if the DAT is not so great, we think it's unfair that, well, we, we don't want to do too hard on that when then the next person hasn't even taken it. You know, it's almost like you're, we don't want to make it a benefit to not take it. You know what I mean? We just wanted to make it a, like an even playing field, uh, so to speak. Um, and if I've confused you, I hope that's, uh, we can get that cleared up and you let me know. Um, so that's, that's the short answer on the DAT. Another part of that too is just, you know, we've looked hard at the DAT analytically um, the last few years and looked at the data around just how strong a predictor it is for success um, in dental school. And it's just so-so, you know, when you really look at the data, it's not, it's pretty, it's, a, it's, a, it's an okay predictor for your good GPA in the first year and in the second year, a good GPA. Does that mean you're going to be a great dentist? No. Um, so, you know, we don't discount it, of course. Turns out GPA, according to what we looked at in the data, is actually a, a better predictor of uh, performance in the first two years, right? But there's so much else that goes into being a dentist that, uh, we, so we put it, it's about perspective with DAT and GPA, because we want to see what else is in that file as well. You know, we want to see just who you are and what you've, where you come from, what you've done, what you've overcome, what your successes are. Um, so I think I covered, yeah, let's just go on to the next slide, please. Can I just chime in really quick here? Of course. So, you know, in, for me, and, and I appreciate the fact that, that Dr. Hewlett, I kind of knew how he felt about the statistical analysis and the DAT. You know, I, I went to him and I said, you know, why, why don't we just make it optional this year? And he was very receptive to that, which I, which I appreciate. Selfishly for our committee, and, you know, we talked about it's rolling admissions and, you know, getting your applications in early. You know, if it wasn't optional, then we might not be able to review your application till a much later time. Or we might review it if we consider it complete without, but then take it later and then we'd have to go back again. It just seemed like a really muddy process that way. Um, you know, we know a lot of undergraduate schools are not looking at SATs anymore or some schools are optional. So we, we just sort of jumped in with both feet and yeah. I am gonna own it if it doesn't work out and we had really crappy class because of this, it's gonna be my fault. There you go. But I, I can already tell you that's not going to be the case. I, mean, I don't think so. Either. I've been, you know, Dr. Margolis is not on the committee. So, you know, he's not seeing the applicants. I'm seeing the applicants. And Dr. Margolis, don't, don't you worry about a thing. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Shadowing. All right, what does that mean? Around 100 hours. That's, it's, it's not a hard and fast number. Oh, 95, sorry. No, the idea is that we want to see enough shadowing to be confident that you know what you're signing up for, that you've had enough exposure to the practice of dentistry to see what it's like and be sure that this is for you. And 100 hours is, is you know, the point about 100 is that, you know, if you accumulate 100 hours in a dental practice setting, shadowing is not going to be something that the committee seizes on and decides whether it's enough. You know what I mean? The lower you get, then the more that might come up as a problem. Um, be sure to shadow at least one general dentist. Um, 
and I, I would actually spend some substantial time in the general dentist's office and hopefully get get your letter from a general dentist. Um, and when you're there, you know, ask questions. Don't be a pest, but you know, play you play it by ear. But um, ask questions. Be proactive. Um, uh, pay attention, and then learn learn how things are run there. And you know what? Ingratiate yourself to the staff. The staff are the key. If you try to help out, what can I do? How can I help? Then you're not in their way. Then they like you. And then, you know, if they like you, then they, they want the dentist to like you. And, you know, you get to do more stuff. Um, you know, every year there's a number of applicants that apply and they start out shadowing and they end up getting a job as a dental assistant in, in an office. You know, it, it does happen. And it's because, you know, you, you're showing up with your, with your A game, with your best self and being very interested. So, you know, don't just stand there and watch, you know, be, be involved. And if it sounds, you know, dentist kind of gives you like, you know, okay, that, that's fine. I'll, I'll explain later. Let me just focus on this. Then pay attention to that. Some dentists love to talk about what they do. You know, a lot of dentists do. And so they'll be happy for that opportunity. Um, Dr. Hewlett, if I could chime in really fast, I just yes, want to please. explain the reasoning for shadowing a general dentist, because I'm sure a lot of you guys know UCLA is known for their specialty programs, right? Yes. A large number of our class will go on to a specialty program. So, okay, so then why general dentistry? Sure. Well, um, okay. I, I'll, I'll be happy to answer that. For sure. Elizabeth. Um, so, yes, we do get a disproportionate number of students who do apply to specialty programs, and that's that's fine. Um, it, it doesn't, it, if, if your application, if in your application, you already seem to have completely made up your mind, um, that's not, that's not the best look you want to, you want your application, even if that's true, um, you want your application to have a little more humility that, that you're keeping an open mind that you're going to at least get into dental school and, and start figuring it, figuring out, you know, seeing what it really is, um, uh, even even if you already know in your heart that that you want to be an orthodontist, you know. Um, and the other thing too is that even though a lot of our students apply to dental school, dental schools are accredit accreditation is based on graduating competent general dentists, you know. So that's that's the standard we have to meet, and um, you know that's that's and that's what we have to we have to produce a, 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 a competent general dentist and so you have to know what that is and that's why um, you know I, I would tell you, I would tend to steer away from having no general dentist I think that's maybe a better way to say it Elizabeth don't have zero dental general dentist shadowing um, it's not the death knell but it's a better look if you've got some substantial hours or general dentists, and then you can mix in some specialists as well. And then this is not one of those hard and fast rules, you know, it's just, it's, a, it's a kind of a guideline. And I'm going to start to study this, but I will bet you a nickel that most of our students that come in thinking they want to be whatever, periodontist, oral surgeon, by the time they leave, they've completely gone on to something else. Yeah. So. Yeah. Don't be sure you know everything right. yet. Okay, now let's go into um, what we got here, volunteering. Again, this is kind of a guideline number. The point here, uh, the real points here are, as it says, find what you're passionate, you know, volunteer for something that you want to do anyway. And then you're going you're gonna to go there more. You're going to accumulate more hours. Um, and volunteering or, you know, volunteering slash community service. The whole idea of that is it's very important for us to get to, to be able to, to be convinced that service is an important part of who you are, you know, that, uh, um, that you are committed um, and happy to be committed to serving others. That's what we do in health healthcare. That's what we do in health professions. And so, um, demonstrating that by volunteering. Volunteering for what? Whatever can be categorized as service to others. Doing something for some other people and not getting anything back for it, except the satisfaction. So does it have to be dental? Absolutely not. Um, it can be all kinds of different community activities, you know, food banks and, and um, 
and health screenings and, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, hospice care places. And um, it, it, it's, it, it's so broad and wide. Or, you know, community clinics, medical clinics or dental clinics. The point is, you know, you want to show that this is part of what you do. And with this, until the year you're going to apply to suddenly do all of this stuff, because then it looks a little, then it looks more calculated, like, you're, like it's a checklist. Oh, okay, well, I haven't gotten my, this, these hours yet. Let me hurry up and do it right now. But doing it a little bit along the way indicates that, well, this is really something you're interested in. You know, you, you, you're volunteering because you want to volunteer. This is meaningful to you. You've been interested in dentistry, you know, for, you know, before this year. You did shadowing before 2020. Um, and I will, I will address the impact of COVID on shadowing and volunteering opportunities well. So I, I don't want to get too far into weeds about that, but we'll, as we start the questions, I will get into that as well. Dr. Margolis, anything to add here? Uh, no, I, I think you, what you just said is great. It really shows a commitment when, when you yeah. see, you know, an extended period of time spent on a given activity. Yeah. Okay. So let's go, go onward. On. So the personal statement is just that, or I like to, I like to describe the personal statement as your first interview because uh, this is where you're now, you're speaking directly to the admissions committee, you know, which is what your interview is. So as it says here, you really wanna make sure they have no doubt as to why you wanna be a dentist. What is it that motivates you? What is it that drives you? Maybe there's a story there like Dr. Margolis's story. We see a lot of that. If you were inspired to be a dentist because you were very shy, about your smile and then you had orthodontics and it changed your life, tell it. Do we see that a lot? Yes, we do, but it happens a lot. Um, or what, whatever the spark was, you know, let us know about that. And, you know, I should be able to read that and see, yes, if this is something you thought about, this is, a, it's a passion for you. Um, and, you know, it's, it's clear that, you know, you wanna do this for the right reasons. Um, that it speaks to you and that, you know, you see the impact it can have on people just as we were talking about. Um, I hope, you know, I'm sure you all know this, but, you know, you have to let other people read this, you know, people that you trust um, and uh, help you proof it and, uh, and edit it and to see how it sounds to another set of ears. Um, and, you know, don't try to be somebody else when you write the thing, just like in an interview. Don't try to show up as somebody else. You would never do that. Well, don't try to do it in an essay as well. I think the ones that read best are, one, you know, they're very straightforward and, and candid and well-written, you know, well-structured and written. Um, but getting creative, uh, you know, you got to be real careful with getting creative and trying to be, try, you know, you know, trying to write a, a short story or, or, or a, um, a, a monologue, comedy monologue, or, or just something too frilly and fancy to get attention. Um, be very, very careful with that. That doesn't always fall the way you want it to fall, you know? Um, I just, you know, be, be straightforward, be honest, speak from your heart. You can never go wrong if you write and speak from your heart on your personal statement. Um, Dr. Margolis. Yeah, I'm just going to chime in. You know, I always make the point to to try to come to the point early, first paragraph or top of the uh, second yeah, paragraph, yeah. as to why it is you want to be a dentist. What's what is your motivation for dentistry? Um, you know, these these guys in the committee, uh, they're reading a lot of applications this goes for any school and it can be and i did serve on the committee one year it's exhausting to read all of your application and i you know we do that we spend a lot of time but don't make us hunt for it okay um it's <laughs> i'm going to tell the story dr hewlett yeah it's a great An story Go ahead, Anne elizabeth um 
and I have to be careful because this was a student that was admitted uh to our school he wrote this it was a very good personal statement in terms of how it was written uh he got to the word dentist or dentistry about 1500 words uh, in the last <laughs> paragraph into his personal statement and i didn't really like his personal statement and i won't get into what he talked about just in case he's you know he's uh, zoom bombing me here and he's on the call but um you know we just talked about something that showed that he was a problem solver and dr hewlett loved this personal statement this is why we have a committee of nine or ten people because yeah. we all look at it differently and we have a conversation and i was overruled and he was admitted to our school and he's an excellent student and so i'm an idiot so there you go that's not what's up. It's I've um, you know I've been on the other side of that that kind of story as well. So let's move on. All right, letters recommendation. Um, I like to say that you want to write the letter yourself. <gasps> Did he forget this is being recorded? No, I don't mean I don't mean it like that. What I mean is. You want your letter writer to know enough about you, to have enough to work with. You have to give them enough to work with where they can write you a very informed letter. You know, we see some letters that are tragically very, very short and brief. I mean, literally, you know, three, four sentences. Um, that's not what you want, you know? So, so how do you do it? You spend at least in one office, you know, enough hours so that the dentist really gets to know you. Uh, if it's a class, you know, a science class, um, especially, get to know the professor. Go to office hours. Be a regular. Show interest. Let them get to know you. Let them get to recognize your face. Be uh, active in class if you if if you're fear of that person. Uh, in a lab session, you know, be help your students. Help the other students. Be generous. Be a leader good natured, um, uh, you know, show intellectual curiosity that you're engaged with the material. Um, just be a nice person, be friendly. And then the, the, the writer is going to be able to write about all these things about you and as well as your motivation. How do you give that to him? Well, you be that person and let it show. But then when it comes time to write the letter, um, ask to meet with that person. Or nowadays it might be a Zoom meet, you know, but don't just email them and ask for the letter, please. You know, you can initiate it that way or go if you can't see them in person these days, but let them know, you know, I, Professor, I'd be really grateful um, if I could spend a few times with you, a few minutes with you on the phone or Zoom, because I want to, you know, talk about my motivation for being a dentist. And, you know, so you've been setting it up and now, you know, you're icing on the cake and they write, they'll write you a great letter, but you got to help them out, you know? Um, as it says here, two, you know, at least two of your, you know, your four letters, right? So I would strongly recommend at least two of them from a science professor, because uh, science courses carry a lot of weight and good performance in science course or good letter from a science professor carries a lot of weight. Those are the strong, those are the most impactful ones. If it's a good letter, you do want to have one for a dentist. We don't require that, but it's rare that we don't, that we see someone that doesn't have a dentist letter. Some schools, absolutely, most schools, I would say absolutely require it. We just we kind of expect it. And then the third one can be up to you. Um, for a lot of you, that's going to be yes. Yeah. Some people have been out working at some job or some career and then come back to dental school to apply. And so maybe from that manager or that supervisor uh, would make more sense for you. Um, and... Um, Oh yeah, it's not mandatory to get a letter of recommendation from core sciences, but you know, if you do well in those courses, those are really good ones to get. But it's if you think you can get a much better written letter from a psychology professor or a math professor or even one of the one of the um, you know social sciences, if it's going to be like if you think this is going to be a, just a spectacular letter, then you know I would actually go for that rather than you know just a a uh, perfunctory letter from a science professor. I'm watching the time here, Dr. Margolis. Okay. I was just going to jump in and say, go faster. Yeah, However, I, 
Uh, I just want to say there, there are, uh, there's a question in the chat, and we will come back to those questions when we're finished. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, let's move this along. Um, we set this apply. Have early. Yeah, explain your weaknesses. Don't be shy about that. Um, be honest about your hours, of course. Be honest about everything. You know, don't even think about trying it. If it, it'll come back to bite you. Um, we've been reading applications a long time and we can kind of sniff out some things, you know, they're a little sketchy. Um, I think, if, you know, you're reading these, I think these speak for themselves. I'm not going to read them to you. So let's go on to the next one. And um, yeah, you apply early. So you get looked at early and, um, you know, you get considered before the class fills up, um, you know, and every year we do get some people who don't apply until right before the very deadline in December. And we're, you know, we're done by that. Um, uh, and as close as you can get it to when the cycle opens, you know, I would say, you know, if you're in, you know, if you get it in like before, before the, the early August, middle of August, um, you, you'll be okay. Uh, you know, but earlier, earlier is better. Um, but don't rush it to be June 1st, if you need until July 1st or, or August 1st to get it right. Uh, and then what do we got next here? And, oh yeah, okay. Um, well, let, here's a couple of short answers here. Is the DAT requirement still gonna be waived? We do not, we do not know. Okay, I guess this is as good a time as any to talk about leniency on shadow and volunteer hours. So here's what I can tell you, we haven't really you know, it, it, we're gonna have to finish this cycle first and then, but I, I think what it's gonna amount to is that, A, just like this cycle, there is gonna be an acknowledgement that COVID-19 did deprive some opportunity uh, for shadowing for, for applicants this cycle. Um, next cycle, I think we're gonna have to look at, you know, just what the what the time timing was, you know, when, because when you apply next cycle, presumably it's gonna be a lot more time outside of when everything was literally closed down that you can still shadow and still volunteer. Now let's, let's season that a little bit with the fact that when offices first started opening up, they weren't really feeling a lot of shadowing, you know, because they had to keep distancing and, um, you know, can't have too many people in the office. I think we're getting, we'll pass that now from what I hear so um, it will be a, it will definitely be a consideration. Uh, we understand that it it you know to varying degrees it will continue to be an issue, uh, but you know what? Um, assertive people find a way to get it done. Um, there are people getting shadowing done right now, um, and uh, assertive people get it done. Some of them are just lucky because they have a hookup, but um, and God love them. But, uh, you know, for the rest of us, you know, you got to you got to work it out and get out there and and hustle. And, uh, you know, that's 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 the other strategy to do that. So I think that's enough of too much of us, not enough of you. So um, you say there's already questions in the chart, Dr. Margolis. There, there are uh, in, in the in the in, chat. I'll go there in two seconds. I just want to make two quick points. Uh, one is the, the two uh, dental students that we have on the admissions committee are there primarily, not primarily, they, they are equal voters uh, on, on the committee, but they're looking at social media. Ooh, so yeah. if we can figure out who you are and where you are in social media and you have some uh, really obnoxious, scary looking uh, posts on social media, uh, you will not be accepted into our school. So take a look at your social media, clean it up. Don't put anything silly on there that you will yeah. regret later. Um, and the other thing is watch your hours that you that you put down for the different uh, activities, the various activities that you do. We have seen applications where you know, we just know this applicant did not do 60 hours a week worth of volunteering and this and that and the other. It's just no way. We're good and at math. We're good at math. On, we, on the, we can on do math. Yeah. We, can, we can do math. And when, and when we get you in for an interview, we'll ask you, and you may not remember what you wrote on your application. So be able to back it up. So um, 
I'm looking at the chat, Dr. Hewlett, I'm going to ask you this question. Okay. Uh, let's see. So if somebody is reapplying, can yes. they submit the same letters from the first application cycle or would it be better to have updated letters? Yeah, at the very least, um, get them updated with new dates um, at the very least, because, you know, it, 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 I think at least it looks like, you know, you're, you're, you're putting effort into it. Um, and the other thing too, is that if you're applying again, you better have some additional stuff because that's always going to be a question on the application. What have you done for me lately? You know, what have you done since the last application to improve your, I don't think it says to improve, to make us want to accept you, but um, that's essentially what they're asking. What have you been doing with your time? If you've been backpacking in Europe, um, that's not, that's not a good answer. Uh, you know, have you been getting more shadowing hours? You know, maybe you had set to work to make money. Okay, but that's that's fine. Um, but it's it's the the, the letters. Um, you know, give the writer a chance to update the letter. You know, if if there's something significant for them to um, to update it with. You know what I mean? Uh, but at the very least, yeah, get get new dates on them. Okay, Natalie and Bianca had this question. Um, I'll, I'll take this one. Can one of the, uh, those science professors be a professor you do research with, but not taken a class with? Absolutely, uh, yep. positively. Yep. You know, research is not something that we require, uh, but certainly it looks great on an application if you've done research, if you, ha if you have uh, taken part in a publication and those letters are definitely uh, great to have. And uh, I just wanna throw one other thing out there. Our school has a combined DDS PhD program. It's a little checkbox on the application somewhere in there. And so if you are at all interested in that, that is an amazing seven year program where you would come out of here and the world would be your oyster. So I'm just gonna, if you really love research and you really love dentistry, you can combine them into an amazing career. Uh, let's see. Uh, how is UCLA's dental admissions process different than other schools? Well, one thing, I don't know if anybody else has waived the DAT for this particular cycle. At the time that we did it, no, nobody else had. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure either. I, I, I think my, my answer to that is um, I think that we're more similar than different. And by that, I mean the uh, imperative of conducting a holistic admissions review is something that, that most of the dental schools in the country share. Um, to really look at the whole student, to look at all of the experiences and to look at all of the factors. Uh, and I, you know, I've said it many times already, you know, what have you accomplished? What have you overcome? And, you know, if you've had, if you're somebody, you've had every advantage, um, you know, you've got a parent that's a dentist, you've got another parent that's a professional, you've been groomed for being competitive to get into college all your life and you've done well, um, fantastic fantastic you know that's that's that, that's you know that's it's, it's such a blessing and you know you're going to do well you're going to be very competitive but everybody doesn't have it like that and so we're not going to compare uh someone who um who whose parents are immigrants and um never finished high school and you know have worked um manual labor just to say, just to raise their kids. And you as an applicant, you had to figure out everything yourself about how to get through school and, you know, how to, you know, how to find your way into dental school. Um, you know, it's a whole different story. And chances are your grades are going to look different. So that's what I mean. I think most, most schools really, really do that, really make an effort to do that. We don't have a lot of hard cutoffs. Some, some schools say, well, you know, if the GPA is below this, you know, we don't, we don't do that. If the DAT is below that, we don't do that. And I said that the, the hours are guidelines rather than, you know, well, you better make that mark or you're not gonna, we're not gonna look at your application. Um, so that's how I would, I would answer that. Um, I think we do really do a good job of the holistic review. Um, 
and our, our, our committee is very sensitive to those issues and, and looking at everything and considering it. Um, okay, Sorry. Ken, oh, go ahead. I agree with that. I just want to also say, you know, when we have our first couple of rounds of um, interviews, I sometimes ask, are we the first interview you've had? I do think we're starting earlier than most other schools. And so, again, keep harping on that point of rolling admissions and getting in early. Yeah. If I could uh, also share my experience with um, mm. the school's application process, um, with the ad styles, they're all pretty much the same. But when it came to the interviews, something that stood out to me with UCLA was how welcoming everyone was and how relaxed it was. Um, UCLA was the only one where I just felt like I was having a conversation. It was actually Dr. Margolis who was interviewing me. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I don't think we and talked about it. still you came. I know. <laughs> of that too but um at every other school I definitely felt those nerves up there you know but I came here and I was talking to Dr. Margolis and at some point I just forgot that I was even in an interview it was just it was a very nice experience I, I must have been off that day no stop <laughs> thank it. you for that <laughs> um, uh, okay so let's see can the letters of recommendation be from a community college professor I'll go fast with this one and you can chime in Dr. Hewlett uh, sure. I, I think the community college route has been a really successful uh, route for a lot of students who have done very well in our program so I do. And not only has it been a successful route for so many students, it's an absolutely necessary route um, because, you know, a lot of students just can't afford to go to university for four years. Um, and, we, you know, we absolutely understand that. And so then what it comes down to is what kind of level, right? And if that's the community college professor, then that's where you want to go. I will say that, um, I would I would try your best to get at least one letter from the four year university as well. Um, sometimes that's that's not a, you know so, some students it's not as easy as as others. I would at least try to do that. But um, a strong letter from community college is a strong letter. Period. All right. Is the admissions committee interviewing at a similar rate to previous years, or is it expected for the interview timeline to stretch longer this cycle? Uh, I, I'm going to say we are reviewing applications at exactly the same rate as we've done in the past. Um, the rate of interviews is maybe a little down from last year, but not much. And I believe the, the timeline for when schools can um, can inform applicants that they've been accepted is a couple of weeks later this year. Um, I don't know the exact date. I want to say like December 18th uh, or something like that. It's December um, 15th. December 15th. Okay, I stand corrected. Uh, let's see, does dental assisting count towards shadowing hours? Okay, Dr. Healy, you want to take that one? You know, that that's actually a, um, a pretty good question, uh, more so than it seems. Um, this year, there's been a change in the application. It used to say shadowing, you know, that was it. And so it's easy. Now there's a section called dental related experience. And there's another se section called shadowing. And nobody seems to understand exactly what that means. We see shadowing activities in the dental related experience, you know, and um, so I think, you know, dental related experience is maybe, um, well, it's something where you're in the dental milieu, but not shadowing. Uh, you know, maybe it's um, it's going to pre dental act pre dental day at a, at a dental school or a virtual one. But then that also go that can also go under academic enrichments as well. So here's here's you know here's the thing: make sure everything you do is somewhere on there. Um, the way it works for us, you know, we're going to read what's under dental related experience. We're going to read what's under shadowing, um, and we're going to figure it out. You know, shadow. It's going to be clear because even it even says, you know, what were you doing? And it, you know, you put shadowing. Um, you know, what was the experience? What, what was shadowing? Okay, and was it volunteer or paid? You know, some people had to work as um, you know in dental offices um, and apply. So. Um, answer then yeah absolutely well it counts as yes 
it counts as shadowing, you know, because it used to be, it would all go under shadow. It, you know, that would be counted as shadowing. If you're a dental assistant, that would go under employment and it can still go under employment. Um, and if this sounds crazy, don't freak out about where to put the things, you know, we'll find it. Um, but yeah, dental, dental assisting is strong dental experience. And how can it, you know, it's, 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 it's better than shadowing, you know, cause you're not, you're not shadowing somebody, somebody would be shadowing you, you're actually doing. So, um, that's tremendous experience. That's counted, that's counted, uh, at least as strong as, uh, as shadowing, probably a little more. I'm, I'm going to say in terms of our committee members being able to figure out what's what, uh, as we say in Boston, they're all wicked smart and <laughs> they are on it. Don't you worry about it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. On account of uh, COVID-19, have any changes been made to the rolling admissions model? Uh, I'm going to say no. I mean, the, the changes have been made to how we do things on your interview day. You know, everything's remote and, and you know, I do a PowerPoint, you know, sharing the screen and it's, it's, you know, it's not quite as personal, but I found the interviews th that I've done uh, have been, they've been great. You know, we don't worry so much about how good your eye contact is and we don't know how firm your handshake is, but you know, you're still, the content is, is the same and the process is the same. I've, I've been pleasantly surprised. I was concerned, you know, we were gonna miss some nuance, but I've been pleasantly surprised that it's gone well. Um, I, I think the next one is about COVID and GPA. Is that right? How has, how has COVID affected how UCLA is looking at GPA? Um, I'll answer that this way. There's a, um, uh, not a great deal, but there is a section on the application out. I'm sure it'll be there for another couple of cycles. Pandemic uh, affects your, you know, there, there's there's several prompts and it just says write one answer. But, you know, did it affect your ability to study or to take your classes and da 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 da? And then you lay it out there. For some people, you know, they couldn't get the classes they wanted or. Um, you know, it really, they have to be at home. And, you know, for a lot of people, home is not a great place to study. Um, and, you know, we, we, we see that story. Uh, I think the biggest thing is that, you know, we, we decided very quickly we had to accept um, online courses. We, we, we didn't accept online courses before. We decided very quickly we had to step, accept online courses if they had to be taken, um, you know, after the, you know, after the campus is closed. And I think we're still going to have to have some of that for at least another cycle, at least another cycle, maybe two, you know. So I think, but but as far as, um, unless someone gives a real compelling reason why their GPA got, you know, either just their, their ability to, to successfully complete their classes got seriously interrupted, um, they're still gonna look at GPA more or less the same way. Okay, um, this one says not really for admissions, but how does UCLA compare to other schools and the number of hours of clinical practice required for graduation? I I'm gonna be honest, it's a great question. I don't think I'm qualified to answer the question because I don't know the curriculum and the clinical yeah. experiences required at other schools. Um, Elizabeth laugh at this and say, no, you're full of it, but our clinical experience uh, requirements, I don't like using that word, are very much less than 2014. So um, almost half in, in a couple of the disciplines. I, I can tell you that um, there, there are no standards in dental education for a number of hours. Um, we, have, we all have accreditation requirements that we have to meet, but the accreditation requirements are written in terms of how do you, de how do you develop competency and how do you assess competency? Right. And then for different schools, then they, they, they figure it out, you know, as far as um, what that means, uh, what they want their students to do, what kind of experiences they want them to have. And so that can vary from school to school in order to meet that, that competency. Um, but um, I, I really can't answer as far as, you know, to compare the experience from our school. I just, you know, we just don't know enough about um, the clinical experience 
of other schools. Um, we feel good about our students' clinical experience, and we're grateful for our community-based um, clinical education program where students are getting a lot more um, experience in the community now and really bolstering up their clinical experience. Um, so we're very grateful that we have that program. That's really, that's really been a significant factor in our students' uh, clinical experience. But, you know, it's about competency. And, um, you know, we have to show, and when they come around every seven years for accreditation, say, okay, how are you doing it? I mean, they, they really, you know, they really, they're, they're looking under the carpet and looking in all the corners and under the closets to figure out how you're doing this stuff. And it better be right. And uh, so we don't, um, you know, there's no, there's no cheating on that. Uh, Elizabeth. How, how much time do we have? We have a lot more questions and I'm happy to stay, but if people need to go or whatever, you just let me know. Um, it's up to you too. Um, I was just going to cut it off at 8.10 just to respect your time, but it's up to you guys. Already late for dinner, so it's not a problem. Okay. <laughs> All right, but I'm gonna, let's, let's make this a little bit more rapid fire. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah. What is the interview process like? Is it more intimate or does it does a panel of admissions officers interview multiple people? So right now, the way we're doing it is you will have one interview with one faculty member um, and then you will have a, and that's about 35 minutes followed by a second interview with one other faculty member. So the interview kind of looks like uh, Dr. Hewlett and I do a presentation. You learn about financial aid. You have 35 minute interviews. Um, I'd like to think it's pretty comfortable uh, and intimate, but that's, that's the process. I can take the next one. Um, does UCLA lean towards problem-based learning as the main learning modality? No, we don't. Good answer. And yeah. uh, um, do you recommend shadowing from a UCLA dental school graduate in terms of rec letters? Not necessarily. No, no, we don't. Um, a, you know, a good letter from a dentist is a good letter. So, you know, I'll see a letter because I, you know, I've been here forever. So, uh, you know, I know all the graduates just about after the first 12 years or so. So um, of the school's existence. So, oh, yeah, I know that person. But no, I would say don't 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 go out of your way to find a UCLA dentist, please. Um, to shadow and get a good letter from. That's not, that's not a good investment of your time. Are post-December interviews common or do you plan to fill up the class beforehand? Um, I, I've sort of been on a mission to fill the class by December, which means we have 88 spots. We might send out 120 invitations. Some people are going to decline. And then there's that dance, you know, during the the subsequent months where some students are holding spots at multiple schools and so one or two might drop and, and then but we already have sort of our our next batch of you can call it wait list or whatever people decided upon by December that's the goal uh, is there a reason that dental schools do their admissions in cycles slash rolling admissions compared to reviewing all the applications at once like undergraduate programs? Eesh. Well, I mean, I, I think because it's, it's such a big broad cycle and students are getting their stuff in at such varied times. And because I'm type A, I, I, I wanna get them way dental school admissions goes it is um you know the the cycle is what it is and the, the the timing is you know when it opens when it closes when letters go out uh when school starts you know that's all that's all set and it's been that way for a long time also i think a big part of it is um you know to to be able to wait and collect applic let's just say we waited until december 31st and then looked at everything and then just sent out the acceptances and we're done. Or I guess we still have to interview. Maybe that's part of it too. We have to interview, you know, undergrads don't do that. But the other thing too, is just the infrastructure. Well, I guess they don't really do it, but infrastructure at UCLA where they get 110,000 applications for their freshman class. I don't know how they do it, but they must have an army of people 
that are involved in that process, literally. And, and we don't. And we don't. No, de <laughs> no dental school does. No. It's, it's very different in, in it's the, very in the different, health yeah. care schools. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There are currently pre-dental virtual shadowing going on through pre-dental organizations. Would that be allowed as shadowing with the current pandemic, Dr. Hewlett? I've given it a lot of thought. Um, and my advice to you, I've, I, I, I've told some pre that said, look, you know, if you absolutely can't find a place to shadow, there's so much there, you know, so much online, the pre-dental or virtual shadowing. Absolutely. Uh, watching some, you know, there's a lot of quality videos you can watch and learn. Do that too. And I don't know how, you know, the best I can tell you is to keep a log, you know, keep a log of, you know, I attended this, um, this is what, you know, it's the brief description, or I watched this video from this doctor on this procedure. Uh, for this long, and just like in just a very few words, here's what I learned. And keep a log and have that ready. You know, it, it may come to that. I don't know. But it, what can it hurt? What can it hurt to be able to say, this is what I did, and to be able to document it? And yeah, is there a lot of room for dishonesty there? Of course there is. So I don't know how that's actually going to manifest itself, but that's the best advice I can give you is to, yeah, don't, don't just throw up your hands. You know, go online. Uh, go to these virtual shadowing opportunities and document them. I would hope too at these virtual shadowing opportunities that they send you some sort of, you know, acknowledgement that you did it. Uh, I don't want to get too in the weeds for that with that though. Um, is uh, research important? Is, is Dr. Markles, it's not essential here. We don't require it. Um, if you've done a lot, okay, actually here is an easier answer. Do research because you want to do research. Don't do research to get into dental school. Do it because you want to do research. Then you're going to do it and you're going to love it and you're going to do it well, you're going to get a great letter. If you just think you need to do it to make your application look good, you're, going to, you're not going to like it and you're probably going to quit and you're not going to get many hours. Do what you love. If you'd rather shadow more hours, if you'd rather do more, hopefully do more community service, if you're if you if you're not want to, if you don't want to do research, put your time there, um, but don't do it just because you need to do it or just because you feel you need to, especially not for us. All right. So let's see. Is it true that UCLA no longer favors in-state applicants since the transition from Dean Park to Dean Krebbach? <laughs> in other That's words, very interesting. What are the percentages of in-state students in the <laughs> classes of 2023 and 24? I don't think the transition of the deans has no. anything to do with this. No, but it doesn't. I, but I, I will say, again, being an East Coast guy, I love seeing East Coast Midwest, whatever people come here. I think the demographics that I showed before, or maybe I didn't, is that we drew from nine states in 2023. Yeah. Not enough as far as I'm concerned. Um, we value geographic diversity and all other types yes, of we diversity. Do. Um, yeah, and actually our, our current dean is really big on geographic diversity. Um, yeah. And we're under, we're under no mandate to um, have a certain quota of California residents. We, we, we do have, you know, we have a lot more California residents than out-of-staters, uh, but we look at out-of-state applications. They need to be good. You know, they need to have a compelling reason uh, for, for us to, to accept them. We accept them. The one thing I will say is that I think a couple of years ago, we went, we went really aggressive on that. And the yield was not as great as it was for in-state residents. And so we had to kind of rethink, okay, maybe let, let's just pull it back a little bit because we're going to be offering a ton of applications to out of state and our percent that we capture that come here um, is, is, is not as what we'd like it to be. Well, maybe let's, let's use less of those slots then for that and concentrate, you know, and concentrate more in California. All uh, right. Are uh, they, our interviews at UCLA open or closed file? They are now closed file for the last couple of cycles. And Yay. I think they always will be. We do not want our interviewers getting caught up in your stats. That's already been done by the admissions committee. Yeah. We just want them to learn about you and what you're all about. All right, let's see. All right, Sorry. let's do one last question and then we'll let you guys go. Can I, well, all right. Um, I would like to, I would like to propose this one from Jalen. What are some things that make a successful dental student? 
Um, I see a thumbs up there from Dr. Margolis. Um, all right, uh, I, will, I will tell you that. And Dr. Margolis, you've heard my answer, but I, I'm, I know you, you feel the same way too. The students who are most successful here are the ones who are kind and generous and supportive of their classmates and they care about their classmates. They're generous with their time and talent. They will share their study resources. Um, you know, they'll help you if you're struggling. They are, um, they're good to their, they take good care of their patients. They're extremely well organized. They have outstanding time management skills. Um, and, uh, you know, they're just caring, generous people um, who they understand that, you know, it's about the greater good. It's not, it's not about me. I'm not the center of the universe. You know, if, if we, we're all going to succeed. And Dr. Margolis, I know you have some, some thoughts on this as well. Um, I'll, I'll just add, and some of it is similar, collegiality, yes, <clears throat> collaboration, and a really big one for me is resilience. It's, you know, oh, dental school's hard. So, you know, it's that old saying, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Yeah. And not everybody can do this. So you, you need to have a thick skin or be able to develop a thick skin, and you need to be able to ask for help when you need it. And... and Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go, go. That, that's, that's so important. You have to have that humility or not even humility. Just we want you to feel safe to ask for help. Um, and notice that neither of us said anything about having an astronomical G, uh, GPA. You know, um, the kind of qualities we're talking about transcend GPA. For us, I'll, or may I speak for me, I want to see enough academic performance within the context of what was going on in the rest of your life that we're confident you can make it through a rigorous curriculum. For me, that's what grades are for. Um, it's not a merit. It's not a merit contest. You know what I mean? It's not a meritocracy. It's like what we want people who are going to be good, kind, generous dentists um, and be able to, you know, you can do, you're doing well enough academically that we're not setting you up for failure. There you go. And I just got a text from my wife. She's uh -oh. wondering where, where I am, but yeah, you're it, still it's, at, all, it's all fine. Um, but I did, I, the office. I did, yeah. I did want to say, I, I saw Elizabeth, I saw your note, uh, Dr. Hewlett and I will commit to answering uh, any and all questions that we didn't answer that are on the chat. So if hmm. you want to copy the chat, then. Yes, we'll, you, if, yeah, Elizabeth, if you would do that, please. Yeah, absolutely. We'll we will take it from guys. there. But yeah, thank okay. you both Thanks for having time. us. Thank sure. you so much. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Okay. It was fun. Okay. It was fun. <laughs> I'm glad. Okay. All right. All right. Good you. luck, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Hewlett and Dr. Margolis. Okay. We'll Bye you. now.